Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. I'm going to talk all about the polar vortex here. The stratospheric polar vortex and the tropospheric. Uh, some people call it the polar vortex, but it's really the jet streams, the Rosby waves, and there are connections between them. Um, so if you Google Earth Null School, click on Earth, brings up the menus, and this is what I think the default is at the surface here. Air, this, so this is winds at the surface. If you want to look up very high in the atmosphere, the jet streams are about here at the 250 level. Okay, many of you are familiar with that. If you go to 10 hexapascals, you're going up even higher. The air pressure is dropping and you get the, you're up well into the stratosphere and this is the, the uh, polar vortex, the stratospheric polar vortex. So this is what's happening right now. This is the, uh, this is the North Pole where this um, green circle is. So what you can see is you can see a very strong um, elongated polar vortex here. It's displaced from the North Pole and it's elongated here. So this can vary between very elliptical to very circular and the center of rotation, the centroid, if you like, um, will shift. Sometimes it'll be right over the North Pole, it'll shift around. This is partly split. So this is, all, this is displaced, but it's partly split because some of the energy has broken off and is circling here. Now the intensity of this is very, very low. If the intensity of this was equal to this, it would be completely split. So how does that relate to the lower down, to the troposphere? Because this is up in the stratosphere. Put your right hand in the direction of the winds. Okay, and my thumb is pointing oh, up. Okay, this is looking down at the North Pole, so my thumb is pointing up. So that basically pulls up the tropopause. The tropopause is where the troposphere ends, that's the lower atmosphere, and the stratosphere begins. And I'll explain that in more detail, and I'll relate how this affects, how this relates to very, very wavy Rosby waves and extreme weather events that we're seeing. So right now, so this is uh, right now, okay? And I can go back in time with these and I'll do that uh, shortly. This is Climate Reanalyzer, another very good site. And uh, these are temperatures at two meters. This is temperature anomalies. So right now the Arctic is very warm, okay? 3.9 degrees Celsius above above the um, climatology, which is the 1979 to 2000 baseline. Very, very, you know, 20 degree plus warmer than normal. Right now, we're in a little bit of a warming trend um, in, well, this is the temperature anomaly over North America. So we've been very, very cold. This has been very, very low, um, but now it's, uh, more, it's close to normal temperatures, but there's lots of swings. So this is my website, just to remind you, Google paulbeckwith.net. This is my website. This is my video that I just released yesterday, talking about using chess as an analogy for being an expert at chess versus being an expert at, say, a doctor or an expert engineer or an expert climate scientist, and how experts in all these different areas are treated very, very differently, and how you know we have a big problem with all of these fossil fuel funded fairy tales um, that I discussed. Anybody that denies greenhouse gas warming, that's a clue that, that uh, something else is afoot here. Devious misleading information is afoot. So let me talk about the layers of the atmosphere first. So this is about 10 kilometers, 11 kilometers is the average height of the tropos tropopause. Below is the troposphere where all the weather happened. Up higher is the stratosphere. The ozone layer is up here. You can get very high altitude clouds, weather balloons, spy planes, commercial jets fly up here, close to the jet streams. A lot of them take advantage of the jet streams. 
Um, we generally go from west to east, so if a plane is flying from North America to Europe, it can zip along very quickly, following along the jet streams. Low-level clouds, high-level clouds, uh, cumulonimbus clouds, there's Mount Everest here, just to give you an idea of the type of scale. Okay? One of the things, one of the big um, miss, one of, one of the big call it conspiracy theories, uh, has to do with chemtrails. People think we're spraying these things well, for whatever reason, and they'd be, they're saying they're, it's being done at the level of the tropopause, where the jets fly. But if we want, it's not being done, but we, solar radiation management is a technique that I say we will have to employ, and that's to, you know, in an emergency situation, which I say we have now, we need to slash fossil fuel emissions, we need to extract CO2 from the atmosphere and methane, and we also need to cool the Arctic, and we would cool the Arctic or cool the planet by having sulfur high up in the stratosphere. It wouldn't look at all like these so-called chemtrails, um, which are really contrails, and because the chemistry of the atmosphere has changed because of abrupt climate change, okay, we're getting warming of the troposphere, cooling of the stratosphere, so things are behaving differently at this interface. Um, but anyway, that's another story, really. So, so this just gives you an idea of these two levels. Okay, here we go. Here's the tropopause, about 11 kilometers on average. Because the air is warm at the equator, it's as high as 17 kilometers at the equator. At the pole, the air is a lot colder. It's about 7 kilometers. So it does vary with latitude, but the temperature is warm at the surface, dropping down. Then it state where, where it goes steady, that's the tropopause. And then it increases here and steady here and so on. These are the different layers of the atmosphere. Now, if you go from, if you go from the equator up here, so this is where the tropopause is. The red line, about 17 kilometers. The air is hot, it rises up a long way. You get this Hadley cell circulation. The air rises at the equator, moves south, moves forward, descends, cools down and descends. You get this Hadley cell near about 30 degrees and you get subtropical jet stream here. Then you get these, this gearing, the feral cell gearing. It's descending air here, matching the Hadley descent. And you get the polar jet here. The air rises at about 60 north and descends here. So the air is very dry here. Most of the deserts of the world are here. Here the air is very moist and humid. You get the intertropical conver convergence zone, band of clouds around the earth. Um, here the air is rising up. So you get lots of clouds, lots of rainfall, weather here, the polar jet. And then you have the polar cell here. Okay, now when I talk about the, the so this is all in this troposphere here. This is in the stratosphere up here. The tropopause divides them. When you have a very strong, uh, polar uh, jet, polar vortex, the, the, uh, the, the vorticity is high, the rotation is high, it's, I, as I said, it's pulling up the tropopause. And when you have it weakening, the tropopause will lower a bit. So that's an important point. Okay, so what is the polar vortex and how does it influence weather? Um, okay, so it talks, this, this uh, paper, and you can just Google this title, this is pub publicly available. Okay, um, basically, the, in, in 2014, it was very cold over North America. Meteorologists started calling this the, uh, the polar vortex coming down. Um, so here is a, here, this is a good diagram. This is, uh, there's actually two polar vor vortexes, okay? When you say polar vortex, it really means the stratospheric polar vortex. Okay, and that's this rotation here, which I showed over here. Okay, so this is the polar vortex here. Okay, and at lower altitude, so this is the stratosphere up here, it's up in the stratosphere. The tropopause is the dividing layer between the troposphere and the stratosphere, and, and in that dividing layer, we have these jet streams here, which circumvent the planet. Okay, and so you can see the jet stream here, and there's actually ridges and troughs. This is like separating the cold, dry air in the Arctic from the warmer, humid air south. So warm, humid air goes up here, 
and cold, dry air comes down here. So over North America, we've had a strong ridge stuck down here, and it's because the polar vortex has actually offset from the North Pole, and it brings down, it's like opening the refrigerator door, okay? And the strength of these jets is determined by the temperature difference between the Arctic and the equator. Cold Arctic, warm equator, that large, strong temperature difference creates stronger jets, okay? So we can talk about the something called potential vorticity, okay? And that's sort of a measure of the rate of rotation of the air particles. So if the polar vortex is very strong, the, the winds are whipping the air masses around and it's bringing up the tropopause underneath. And what happens is you get these events called sudden stratospheric warming, where warm air comes up and it disrupts the polar vortex breaks it from being a nice circular pattern, and that's when you get problems with extreme weather. You get weather outbreaks, and this is what, what we've been seeing in, in North America um, once again. Um, so this is what happens. This is showing you the, the pressures, and the, the pressure, so you, this is the surface. This is really high up, about 10 is where the, uh, we talk about 10 is where I showed you the polar vortex from Earth Null School. So what you have in January, okay, where we are now is, is um, you get these, these are westerly winds and the darker, the stronger. Okay, so as you go up, generally they increase in strength um, and it shows you that they're going, they're mostly westerlies. And then when you go down, this is here, and in the southern hemisphere, there's, there are weaker easterlies up high. Up. So the polar vortex kind of disappears um, in the southern, in the, in, where, where it's summer, okay, in the southern hemisphere now. And then here are the, these are the jet streams, basically, the tropospheric polar vortex or the jet streams or the Rosby wave. In July, basically the polar vortex disappears in the northern hemisphere. You get a very weak easterly flow instead of west to east, it goes east to west, and you get a strong polar vortex in the southern hemisphere, and you still have these jet streams in both hemispheres. Um, I'll just look at a couple different things. Um, this is up high, okay, so the polar vortex is like this, okay, it's a black line here, and uh, when you go lower, this is more low, this is at 300 hexapascal, so, so higher pressure, closer to the surface, and you can see this, this, here's a strong ridge, here's a strong trough, and you get these different conditions here. And this is just a measure of how quickly the rotation is, the, the polar uh, potential uh, vorticity. There was a cold outbreak in, in um, January 2014, and this is where the meteorologists started calling it the polar vortex. So what we have here is the white contours are the stratospheric vortex, and the black contours are the tropospheric. Okay, so basically, um, okay, so basically what we're talking about here is this type of thing this diagram right here, okay? The wavy, larger area here for the, pol um, for the tropospheric polar vortex, and the stratospheric one is more confined here. So this is just showing that event in January and how things move. So the ridges and troughs move slightly here in the black lines. This is from 3rd of January, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and you can see the jet how the jet streams are changing, the black line, and how the polar vortex is, is shifting. Okay, I'm going to, I want to explain this in a bit more detail. So I'm going to do a second video because this is, this is a kind of key information. But so I'll start back here in the next video. But in the meantime, um, what we can do here is, if I we can look at what happens to the mean sea level pressure areas. So you can see these areas here. These are low pressure areas and high pressure areas. And there's, there's kind of like a four, there's one, two, three, four here, four major things. And this can be a pattern that's, that's common when the polar vortex is mostly, um, is strong. Thank you.